Welcome to Mr. Patrick's Corner. Today we're going to talk about air rifles and laying down and using a bipod and shooting uphill. It's a, it's a lot of work to do one of these. Believe it or not, I had a six, I think it's six minutes video. And this is the target I used. Uh, the first one went over the target. This is over, this is around a hundred yards, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, but I think it's a little over a hundred. I haven't been able to find my range finder yet. I, I misplaced it someplace. So my first shot was over the target. How can you miss a target this big? The trouble is you're shooting off a bipod, you're laying in a prone position, and if I was shooting straight ahead, it wouldn't be any problem, but I'm shooting at an elevated position. And the elevation is the key thing here. I had to keep adjusting and adjusting my bipod, putting uh, blocks under it to raise it up so I could shoot. So my, so after a while, I tested it out. I used my Air Force uh, modified Air Force Escape because it has a bipod on it. It also has a hundred foot pounds, and it's I like the the side lever cocking on, especially in the prone position. So my first shot went over the target by about six inches. I saw where it hit the berm. That's the backup over there. It prevents bullets from going past that that berm and it's a safety precaution. My second shot was right here at the edge. I'm still shooting too high and this is my second shot. My actually my third shot and it was only an inch or so below the first the second shot. And then finally I readjusted, put another block under it, lowered it some more, and there it is, the bullseye, the hole-in-one. But it's not a hole-in-one because it took more, multiple shots to get the range correctly. That's one thing I like about air rifles. It's fun to shoot. They don't cost a lot of money. And you can have a nice day in the... Right now it's not a nice day, but around six o'clock in the evening with the monsoon and everything in Trona, the weather wasn't that bad. It was a fun, it was a fun thing to do. And I asked my wife, did I hit it? And she says, yes, you hit it. I asked again, did you hit the target? Yes, you hit the target. She can't tell me where I'm hitting because she doesn't understand what I'm trying to do. A lot of fun, but she's a nice, my wife's a nice lady. She has her own blog. She does all the natural stuff over there in, in, in Trona, the lakes, the history, and all that good stuff. But you get to the point where you want to start shooting. You want to start hitting stuff at like this. This is what I normally do out in the range. Sometimes I've had very good success over the Ridgecrest because their platforms are set up so you're shooting downhill, not uphill. It makes it a lot easier because you can figure out where your, where your targets are and where the dirt's picking up. I like using the old artilleryman's deal. I'll pick a, a section of the berm and I'll watch where the, the shot fell and then I'll just dial it in from that point and then I'll transfer it over to the target. And as you can see, you can do pretty well. These are very good. This one's a little bit better. These are the sighting in. And once you get everything sighted in, it's a lot of fun. Now, let's talk about invasive species. I live out here in California. We have uh, eastern fox, uh, fox squirrels. They're an invasive species. You don't, they're very good eating. And you don't 
and you don't need a license to hunt them. They are one of those predator, one of those vermin where the state has said, have at it, guys. Kill as many of them as you can because they come from the East Coast. They have a, um, they have a, a kind of a gold color to them on their bellies. And you have the gray ones, which are also Eastern fox bat, but they're the grays. There you need a license to hunt. Now, you don't have that problem with the wonderful uh, fox bat, uh, fox squirrel uh, from the East Coast with the brown belly. I don't quite understand how they can determine you need a license for one, but not another, a license for the other one. I guess they're better at, at, at expansion. They were, they're non-native. They came from the East Coast. They're pro probably brought over as pets, released or got out. And next thing you know, you've got a lot of squirrels. I hope they don't figure out that we have a lot of nuts in Sacramento, but then, you know, what can I tell you? Um, we have the weir weirdest regulations when it comes to hunting. And that's kind of what makes it fun too, because they put you through all these rigmaroles and they do a lot of other stuff and they, you know. But this winter I'm going to get all set up to, to really go out and have a lot of fun. I still can't take big game here, that includes pigs. I'm fascinated with wild hog. We have the only wild hog that are, are basically non-native. They were, they're Russian black boar. And those are the ones you got to worry about getting drunk and sleeping in the parks in, in, in Berlin. Because a whole slew of them, and they eat people. Uh, the same thing, every northern, northern country, uh, Scandinavia especially, that's Sweden and Finland and Norway, they have special officers trained to the dispatch invasive species that come into the cities. You would be surprised how many moose go into Stockholm. It's like they got this giant country, which is mostly wood, and they still wind up going into Stockholm. Great, you know. And sometimes they're trying to save the poor critter. Other times they got to shoot it. You know, and getting charged by bull moose is no fun. Though you should see what they can do to your car. Now getting hit by a deer, well, that's bad. But a moose or an elk, God bless America. You're, you're lucky if you don't get killed by them. Now, why am I talking about roadkill and hunting and the other stuff? Well, I think we should start thinking about using some of this game that's available and having it, well, it's like Fort Benning. I'm off track again a little bit. Fort Benning has a problem with pigs. Same thing with the other Texas military bases. Fort Benning is in Georgia, I know that. So please don't put in the comments. I know my geography. But they're not using those pigs like they should. They should be using the guys to be getting out in the woods and hunting. And then the guys in the quartermaster corps and the, you know, where the guys in the, uh, the culinary parts of the camp, they should learn how to cook and process pigs and preserve it. Everybody thinks that you know, all you got to do is wait for the airplane to come and, and you'll have food. Well, the Russians are learning that, well, the Russian army's always been an army that travels from what they can pinch, steal, or harvest. And the same thing with the Ukrainians. If you don't have the supplies, it's hard to keep your troops in the field. And right now, winter's coming. And things are going to get worse before they get better for the Russians and the Ukrainians. The aid that we give them, a, surpri a surprising amount of it, is for food. Yeah, well, we give them arms, but they can't use the arms if they're starving to death. So we have to ship them food, MRIs, MREs, meals ready to eat, and a lot of other stuff. They have to get 
money to support the the people that are still in the Ukraine. It's, it's an expensive business. And it basically, we can't go too far because then we'll have a war with Russia. Now, if we could get the two knuckleheads to actually talk to each other, we might have something. I think the best, one of our best representatives is a lady from Virginia, Virginia Sparks. She was born in Ukraine. She's Ukrainian. And she asked a wonderfully pointed question. What happens to all this gear that we're giving them? Do you know what happened with the gear we gave the Afghans? Well, believe it or not, they're selling it on the open market. Yeah, so the stuff that they're selling at the boys that are going to shoot at us again. The Indians are very happy about that because they're catching these guys and, they're, and they got better gear than the Indian Army has. Night vision, M14, M, 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 M4s, uh, anti-tank, stingers, they got them all. And the Indians aren't happy about it. It's like having a fifth column. And in the, it is such a monumental F up. I can't even begin to get that. It's like, well, our Congress is our Congress. They don't, and the American people don't seem to want to ask the right questions. I'm sorry about that. I want to go back to air guns and shooting. I like my gauntlet because I can get 28 regulated shots. Everything is controlled. My Air Forces, neither one of them has a regulator on them. So my shots go up, down, and every which way but loose because that's the amount of air in the tank. The first shot is way high, like I was telling you, because of the amount of pressure in the tank. Then it drops. And then after two or three, you get a good shot stream and you can really put some stuff down. And I love the, the accuracy out of the Air Force. They're very good. The little tank I can't stand because it's a real pain in the fanny to fill. And, you know, it's, it's so customized that it's ridiculous. The money that I spent on that rifle, I probably could have bought uh, an FX or something else. It's you know, but you went, you learn, and you 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 learn by living it. Well, I hope I like to thank all my subscribers, and I hope you keep watching my my shooting videos. I'm not going to be laying down anymore. That's too hard on this old man, and is the fact that I'm a little heavy. Almost every American is a little too heavy right now. But we can do some things about that. When the winter comes, I'm going to do more hiking. My weight comes off. It's like you go to Alaska. In the summertime, the weight is coming off. But in the wintertime, they pack it on because of the fact that the cold and the other, and you burn more calories. Well... I hope everything is good with you. Please subscribe and like. And have a nice afternoon. Bye.